It's Captain Leonard Schroeder of the 2nd Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment, who opens the Seaborne Invasion when he's the first man to set foot on Utah Beach at 6.30am. Schroeder and his men are surprised to find the fire from the Germans is much lighter than expected. In a separate landing craft is the 4th Infantry Division's Assistant Commander, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Son of the President, Roosevelt had to campaign hard to be allowed to take part in the landings. An impressive character, at 56 years old, he was the oldest man to take an operational role in the invasion. He was also the only general to land by sea with the first wave on D-Day. Once on the beach, the reason for the weaker than expected defensive fire is discovered. Strong currents have dragged the landing craft 1.8 kilometers east of their intended landing zone. But Roosevelt and his staff quickly realize they're in a much better position than anticipated. This new landing site has just one German strongpoint, and it's already been badly damaged by the naval bombardment. Roosevelt makes his famous statement, we'll begin the war right here. He orders all subsequent forces to be rerouted to their position. At Omaha Beach, the situation couldn't be more different. Rough seas sink 10 landing craft before they even reach the beach, and seasick troops are forced to bail water from the others using their helmets in an effort to stay afloat. Amphibious DD tanks are struggling with the same problem. The high swell is too much for their protective skirts, and 27 of the 29 tanks in the first wave are sunk. Once again, strong currents drag the landing craft off course. Of the nine infantry companies that make up the first wave, just two land in the correct position. Many of the landing craft release their men onto a sandbar, forcing the troops to wade through neck-deep water for up to 100 yards just to reach the beach. From there, they face a terrifying dash across 200 yards of open sand before reaching cover at a layer of shingle. Soaking wet and exhausted from wading through the sea with their equipment, troops often had to walk rather than run as they make their way across the beach. On the way, they face mines, small arms fire, mortars, artillery, snipers and machine guns. Many of the Americans choose to throw away their weapons and equipment so they can move faster through the hail of death. At 6.35 on Utah Beach, the second wave bring amphibious DD tanks. Unlike their colleagues at Omaha, these have great success, with 28 of the 32 tanks reaching the beach. The third wave followed 10 minutes later, bringing conventional M4 Shermans. The armor, combined with large numbers of infantry, swings the balance of power at Utah Beach firmly towards the Americans. When the second wave lands at Omaha, they suffer many of the same problems as the first wave. To make matters worse, the incoming tide has now covered many of the beach obstacles and the landing craft are running into mines and other submerged hazards. Casualties are running at 50%. Having survived the terrifying beach crossing, the survivors are understandably reluctant to leave their cover and advance forwards. The men are mixed with other units, sometimes from the next company, sometimes from a completely different division. Almost all of them are in the wrong place and a lack of officers to take charge means the Omaha landings are beginning to stall. Watching through his binoculars, the commanding officer of ground forces, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, considers diverting the remaining troops to Utah Beach, where the reports are much more positive. At 10 past 7, companies D, E and F of the 2nd Ranger Battalion arrive on the beaches at Point de Hoc. Their mission is to climb the cliffs and assault the gun battery above that has a commanding field of fire over both Omaha and Utah beaches. The ranger's mission gets off to a bad start when a landing craft is sunk on the way to the beach, drowning everyone on board. Another is swamped by high seas, and several of the supply ships have to throw their supplies overboard just to stay afloat. When the rangers eventually reach the beach, they're running 40 minutes behind schedule and have roughly half the force they're supposed to have. Despite these setbacks, they begin to climb the cliffs using ropes, grappling hooks and ladders borrowed from the London Fire Service. The rangers had planned to fire a flare from the top of the cliffs once they captured the gun battery. This would be the trigger for the five ranger companies in reserve to deploy to Point de Hoc as reinforcements. Unfortunately, the initial delay to the attack means this signal hasn't yet been sent. At 7.15, the assumption is made that the attack on Point de Hoc has failed and the five ranger company reserves are diverted to Omaha. The British have been patiently waiting for the optimum tide for their landings at Gold and Sword. At 7.25, the time has finally come, and they land on the two beaches simultaneously. The German defence at Sword Beach relied heavily on the guns at the Merville Battery. 
Thanks to Terence Otway and his men neutralising the position overnight, the initial waves from the 3rd Infantry Division encounter just moderate resistance from German positions on the beach. Supporting the infantry is the 2nd Armoured Brigade, and unlike their American colleagues at Omaha, almost every tank manages to land safely on the beach. At the same time, the 50th Infantry Division and the 8th Armoured Brigade are landing at Gold Beach, where they encounter fierce resistance from German strongpoints. The tanks that were supposed to land before the infantry arrive late, leaving the men pinned down underneath the seawall waiting for support. When the armour finally arrives, many of the tanks get bogged down and provide easy targets for the Germans. To make matters worse, the tide comes in much quicker than expected submerging the beach defences before the engineers have time to disarm the mines. As a result, many of the landing craft in the subsequent waves are destroyed as they approach the beach. At 7.45, men from the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division begin to land on the final beach, Juno. The Canadians also had to wait for high tide and again many of the beach obstacles were submerged when the landing craft arrived. This made the approach extremely dangerous, with approximately 30% of the landing craft being destroyed before reaching the beach. The pre-landing bombardment has proven to be largely ineffective, and the first wave suffer horrifically. In the Nan White sector, the lead landing craft of the 8th Infantry Brigade takes 90% casualties. In the first hour of the landings at Juneau Beach, Canadian soldiers had a 50% probability of becoming a casualty. Units landing further away from strongpoints were able to make better progress. A platoon from B Company of the Queen's Own Rifles landed much further east than the rest of their company when their landing craft's rudder got jammed. They were able to quickly clear the beach and the barbed wire fences and began to outflank the German positions. The rangers at Point de Hoc have reached the cliff tops where they're engaged in heavy fighting. They slowly take control of each position but discover the casemates are empty and the guns are missing. A patrol would later find the guns a few miles inland and destroy them with thermite grenades. The rangers spent the rest of the day repelling German counter-attacks. Over at Sword, it's taken just 35 minutes to neutralise the immediate defences on the beach, and at 8 o'clock the beach is declared as secure. Eastraham and the areas inland of Sword Beach, however, will prove much tougher and fighting will continue throughout the day. By 8.15 on Omaha Beach, the situation is slowly beginning to improve. Soldiers have realised that the planned exits from the beach, known as Jaws, were too heavily defended to utilise. Instead, they climb the bluffs wherever they can find cover. It's a slow process, but groups of men have now reached the top. From there, they can neutralise the Germans' height advantage and attack the strongholds from their weaker areas at the sides and rear. The following waves of landing troops will still face the same murderous onslaught of fire, but as the number of Americans on the beach increases, the effective firepower of the Germans is diluted. The 500 rangers diverted from Point de Hoc have also arrived, adding significant support to the stalling attack. As more officers arrive, structure begins to return to the beach. One such man is the commanding officer of the 16th Infantry Division, Colonel George Taylor. He yells at the men, there's only two kinds of men staying on this beach, the dead and those that are going to die. Now let's get out of here. Taylor bundles men together regardless of their unit. He then grabs the nearest non-commissioned officer and sends the group forwards with his orders. With the exits from the beach still unavailable, tanks and other vehicles are beginning to build up, providing easy targets for German artillery. At 8.30, the decision is made to suspend landings at Omaha until the situation improves. At Utah, pockets of resistance still remain, but the actual landing zone is essentially secure. Troops begin to proceed inland via the causeways to link up with the paratroopers from the 101st Airborne. Inland, a young lieutenant called Richard Winters from E Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment disables the German gun battery at Breakhorn Manor. The four 105mm guns have been firing on the American troops leaving Utah Beach. Winter's team overpowered some 60 enemy soldiers. Their actions undoubtedly saved many hundreds of lives on Utah Beach. By every possible measure, the landings at Utah Beach have been an extraordinary success. On D-Day, the 4th Infantry Division landed more than 20,000 troops on the beach whilst suffering less than 300 casualties. At 8.40, the 1st Special Service Brigade land on Sword Beach. This group of elite commandos are led by Brigadier Simon Fraser, more commonly known as Lord Lovett. A proud Scotsman, Lovett orders his piper Private Bill Millen to play the bagpipes as they land. 
Millen points out that this would contravene King's regulations, to which Lovett replies, Ah, but that's the English War Office. We're Scottish, so it doesn't apply. By 10am, the follow-up waves have brought enough tanks and supporting infantry for the Canadians to declare Juneau Beach as secure. Juneau came at a significant cost. Around 1,200 Canadian soldiers became casualties in the landings, making it the second deadliest beach, beaten only by Omaha. One hour later, and the British announced that they've secured Gold Beach. Like most of the landing zones, Gold was eventually won by troops breaking through in the quieter areas and then flanking around to attack the German strongpoints from their weaker areas. Gold was an important win for the Allies, as the coastal town of Aramash would become the site of a Mulberry Harbour, allowing essential supplies to be delivered to Normandy. It's midday before Hitler finally wakes up, but when he's told the news of the invasion, he seems surprisingly upbeat. He's convinced the German forces are significantly stronger than the Allies. He also thinks that the poor weather would favour the German defenders, who would be able to throw the Allies back into the sea. Shortly after 1pm, Lord Lovett's commandos arrive at Pegasus Bridge. Lovett apologises to Lieutenant Colonel Pine Coffin for being an hour late. Then he orders Bill Millen to fire up his bagpipes, and the men move out to take up defensive positions around Ranville. By early afternoon, the fighting at Omaha is still ferocious, but the tide is slowly turning in favour of the Americans. Hundreds of troops have now reached the top of the bluffs, and they're making slow but steady progress along the German strongpoints. The Germans are beginning to run low on ammunition, and broken communication lines are causing confusion, making it difficult to coordinate their defence. American engineers have finally managed to open up a route off the beach, clearing traffic jams and allowing the landings to resume. At four o'clock, Hitler finally agrees to von Rundstedt's request to release two armoured divisions to deploy to the Normandy coastline. Given Allied air superiority, however, it's too dangerous for them to travel at daylight and they're forced to wait for nightfall. Almost 12 hours after the first soldiers set foot on the beach, Omaha is finally declared as secure, although snipers and artillery will continue to disrupt activities on the beach for some time to come. Around 2,500 Americans became casualties on Omaha Beach, making it by far the deadliest of all of the D-Day landing zones. At 8 o'clock, the German 192nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment push a counter-attack all the way to the coast between Juneau and Sword Beaches. By pure coincidence, the British 6th Air Landing Brigade fly over the Germans with 250 gliders on their way to reinforce the Orne River bridgehead. Believing they're about to be overpowered and cut off, the Germans promptly fall back. After driving for most of the day, it's 10 o'clock at night before Field Marshal Erwin Rommel finally arrives at Army Group B headquarters near Paris. Convinced the poor weather would stop the Allies from invading, he's been in Germany celebrating his wife's birthday. He begins coordinating counterattacks, but unlike Hitler, he already knows it's too late to stop the Allies. By midnight, the Allied position is extremely fragile. The plan for Operation Overlord had called for the capture of Conn, Bayeux, St. Lo and Carentan on D-Day itself. But as June the 6th draws to a close, all four remain in German hands. Across Normandy, almost 4,500 Allied soldiers lie dead and a further 5,500 wounded. Omaha Beach proved particularly bloody and the planned link-up with forces at Utah has also failed. Crucially, however, both flanks of the invasion have fared well. In the west, forces from Utah Beach have linked up with paratroopers inland, and in the east, Lord Lovett's commandos have reinforced Major John Howard's men at Pegasus Bridge, securing the invasion's left flank. All five beaches are in Allied hands, and every hour that goes by sees more troops, supplies and equipment arriving in Normandy. By midnight, some 160,000 Allied soldiers have crossed the Channel. Rommel had been convinced the Allies must not be allowed off the beaches if his forces were going to repel the invasion. As day broke on June the 7th, and a steady stream of Allied soldiers moved inland, the Great Desert Fox must have already known the war was lost. <laughs>